What other products can you make out of algae? Last December, after our algae surfboard had gone around the world and people had seen it, we got a call from a company called Adidas. And the Adidas engineer said, hey, if you can make a surfboard from polyurethane, then you can make shoe soles from polyurethane. So the next product that we're working on, and we've already started on it right now, are flip-flops made from polyurethane from algae oil. Welcome to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. My name is Lihini Aluihari, and I'm a marine chemist here. So you know, don't don't get excited when you hear the word chemistry. Uh, <laughs> so welcome to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, throughout the day today, you'll have an opportunity to see the sites and talk to scientists here. And you know, please take that opportunity. Ask people questions. Ask your panelists questions. There's so much to learn, and as everyone says, this is your time to discover where you want to go with your lives um, and how you want to contribute to the, to the planet. So how old is the Scripps Institution of Oceanography? Who knows when it was founded? OK, 1903, right? So we've been here a while. We've been studying the ocean out there for a long time. And a few years later, be, we became affiliated with the University of California system, and now we're actually a department of the University of San Diego. So that's how you enter Scripps, through UCSD. There's about 1,000 of us here at Scripps, and about 300 of those people are actually graduate students. So in a few years, that could be you, right? Go through this, stay with this, and you'll end up here. And our students study so many different things in so many different environments. They study the deepest parts of the ocean, the challenge of deep in the Marianas Trench, and of course, you need technology to get down there, right? So that's an important part of our explorations. Some of our scientists study the moon and the planets, OK? So it's not the sea. But understanding what's going on out there can help us understand what's happening in our system. We study animals as small as viruses. And that also requires a lot of different technology. How do you visualize these things? How do you understand their genetic composition? And animals as big as, as blue whales. How do those blue whales communicate? Okay, so we have engineers that study whale communication. We also try to understand how those whales interact with the shipping, um, the shipping that's the increasing shipping lanes that are being built around the oceans. And so we, we employ technology in all different aspects of that. So today you're here to learn a little bit about our relationship with the sea. Humans and the sea, I think, is the name of this program. And our relationship is extremely complex. As you'll hear, um, I think the estimates are that between 50 and 80% of the world's population lives within 60 miles of the ocean. So that, plays a, that places a huge burden in the coastal environment. So what we do here is not, you know, you saw the race to extinction, OK? So that's one way to get people's attention. What, we, what a lot of our scientists do, are doing here today is trying to understand the really detailed um, connections within the ocean, between the ocean, the atmosphere, and the Earth system, and between humans and the ocean, to try to give, up, give the evidence and the data and the basis to make those kinds of movies and to, to raise the alarm. So hopefully you'll get a chance to meet a lot of different people okay, and be inspired. And remember, it's not just today. Okay? This is not your only opportunity to engage with scripts. You're here in San Diego. We're here in San Diego. A lot of our scientists work with the school systems out there. So find us. You know, you know how to use the internet. So find us and build relationships with us and, and use this as much as you can, because we're here to help you as well. So welcome, and I hope you have a wonderful day here at Scripps today. Thank you. So, so thank you all. Um, I'm going to talk about the climate problem and about carbon dioxide, which is what I work on, which brings in the ocean. 
And when I was asked to talk about this, realizing that you guys were going to be focused, among other things, on this mouthful word called sustainability, I thought I'd try to get one particular point across in this, in what I present to you. Now, last night, I got the call to give this presentation only yesterday, and unfortunately, Walter Monk, who was appropriately billed as the Einstein of the ocean, is the person you were supposed to hear from. So you get, you get me instead. Um, sustainability, I, I was talking this through with my wife last night, and she said, whenever I hear sustainability, all I want to do is go to sleep. <laughs> and it's, it's a word that's extremely hard to use in a sentence. And the way I'd say it is this, is, is the, the issue here is living in a way that is sustainable. <clears throat> and if, you're, if you earn $900 a week and you're spending 1000 something goes wrong eventually, no matter how much money you have in the bank. That's a problem. And <clears throat> many of the problems you've heard about in the environment have to do with doing things that are not sustainable. My question to you is what is it about the climate problem that's not sustainable? What is it that we're using up when it comes to the climate problem? So think about it. You, I, I'm sure you've all heard about CO2 and climate change, but what is it that we're using up that's the problem? Because there is something there. Now, there are probably different ways of answering it, but, but please think about that. We'll get back to it. So now I'm going to digress a little bit and talk about the, the history of this problem. So my father played a significant role in the foundation of this field by measuring carbon dioxide buildup. And his story is a kind of interesting and fascinating story, and so I just tell it to you. Now, he moved. Uh, I was born in La Jolla in the late 1950s, and a couple years before that, my father showed up here with, with, with the, the, their small family. Here's a picture of him at that time. He came here with a gadget and a capability. So he'd already done his, his hard work becoming technically proficient and really a world's expert at something. And what he was a world's expert in is measuring a property of the atmosphere that you can't see, you can't smell, but it's all around. It's the carbon dioxide level in the air. He knew how to do that better than anyone else at the time. Roger Avell, the then director, brought him down here because of that capability. And they, at that time, they didn't know that carbon dioxide was changing in the atmosphere, but they had a strong reason to believe that it might be, because they knew fuel was being burned all over the planet, building up in the atmosphere. They set up uh, an instrument on Mauna Loa. Why Mauna Loa? Because it's a long way away from trees and, and cars and things that produce carbon dioxide. It's sampling the bulk atmosphere. It's like taking your core temperature of your body. If you, if you rub your hands together and measure the temperature, you get a high temperature. That's not the temperature you want. You want the core. You want the temperature that tells you about the whole system. They went to Mauna Loa to get the big picture. And it was tricky because there's a new technology. Things don't always go well. So here's the first bit of data. This is uh, early 1958. I was about one year old at that time, OK? Uh, the first data points came in like this, a bunch of scatter. On the other hand, it was about the concentration he expected to find, a little above 315 parts per million. What next? The generator at the station broke down. About a month later, they got it back on. They turned it on, machine on again. Now it was lower, and it was drifting downwards. Is this working, or is it broken? Is this just giving us some kind of erratic signal? Generator broke again. It comes back on. Now it's starting at a lower level and drifting upwards. This looks like a machine that's not working right. It's like my father was here. He wasn't out there. He was, he was upset that this thing was, didn't seem to be going on. Finally, they got the generator to be a little more reliable. And after a while, this is what it looked like. And he realized, oh, lo and behold, we're just seeing carbon dioxide going up and down with the seasons. It's that simple. This is a natural cycle. It's the breathing of carbon dioxide in and out of the forests in the northern hemisphere. This is what's causing this. Spread all around the, the, by the winds. And they kept it going. And after a while, it was pretty clear it was indeed increasing in the atmosphere. This had a lot of impact. A lot of people got into the, climate, the science of climate change at that time because they saw this record. It was proof that the humanity was really changing the planet in a big way. Um, and that's what the record looks like now zipping on upwards. These first couple points down here, those are the ones I showed you on that other slide. Up and up and up and up. Now, what's the problem with this? There are three problems with buildup of carbon dioxide. First is that it changes climate. You've heard about that. That's the greenhouse effect. It traps infrared. Another thing it does that you probably haven't heard about is that it fertilizes plants. It makes them grow faster. That may or may not be a good thing. It's probably partly a good thing. It may be responsible for a little bit more food production globally, but it's not an overwhelmingly benefit thing. And it also, there are winners and losers when it comes to plants doing well. 
if one plant's doing well, another plant's not doing as well, so it may be driven to extinction. And the third thing which you've probably heard about is that it's basically going into the ocean, it's making seawater more acidic. And there are organisms in the ocean that depend on being able to extract carbonate, calcium carbonate, from the water to grow their shells, and they can't do that as well when the water's acidic. So it has direct consequences on organisms in the ocean, on the food chain in the, or in the ocean, and so forth. Um, so let me get back to the question. What is it about the climate problem that's unsustainable? What is it that we're using up? Anyone have an idea? Go ahead. Uh, good. We are using up fossil fuels, so we're using them unsustainable. But that's perfect because it leads into my next slide here. Here's fossil fuels. What are we doing? We're pulling the fossil fuels out of the ground, right? This is a big coal mine in Wyoming, big, massive, 100-foot thick coal seam, one of the thickest in the world. We're pulling this out of the ground. We're basically taking it to power plants. We're burning it. It's going into the atmosphere. So the use of fossil fuel is not sustainable. So that's correct. But it's, in fact, not the essential problem here. There's something else we're doing that we're using up. Any other ideas? Methane. Methane. Methane is also part of the problem. Yes. OK. I think it's plastic production, right? Or... <clears throat> plastic production. Yeah. Um, plastic production might be, in some ways, part of, the pro part of the answer. Because if you can make plastic out of things besides fossil fuels, you actually end up doing things that are good, not bad. So it's, a mi it's mixed up in it, for sure. Um, but so let me lead you on here. Let's talk about landfills. What do landfills do? They're, they're where we dump our waste, right? Now, this is the, this is the Miramar landfill shown in an in a, in a, a, uh, airplane view, and there's a picture of it down below. This is right out. That's at 52 and 805. You guys know where this is probably. You've been, you probably drove by it to get here. may well have. Um, now, we're dumping stuff out there. And the more we dump, the more it piles up, and they keep bulldozing it and trying to get more in. But there's a limit to how much this landfill can hold. You can't just pile it higher and higher and higher. It starts so spilling over onto 805 and 52. You can't do that. We're using it up. OK, now let's go back to another slide here. Here's the cars driving around San Diego. What are they doing? They're burning fossil fuels, which we may run out of. That could be a problem at some point. But we've got another problem. We're spewing all the carbon dioxide out the exhaust, and it's going into the atmosphere. And it's building up in the air, right? And the question is, have we gone beyond the point that it's safe? So what are we using up? We're using up the space for carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is, a, is our dump, and it can only hold so much before we start to have problems spilling over. And we're all probably already at the point where we're spilling over into serious problems. So that's the essential problem with sustainability, is the atmosphere is only so big and we've got to stop dumping into it in order to, in order to prevent serious harm. <clears throat> so I got one final point. Football has a lot of lessons, of course, um, for us. A lot of great life lessons there. So what's this guy doing? He's punting. So when do you punt? Fourth down. Fourth down. So you, you went as far as you could, and you can't go any further, so you punt, right? OK. So what about climate change? This problem, it's pretty bad, right? We've already gone probably beyond a threats, safe threshold. So we, should we just give up and punt, right? Maybe this problem we just punt. So can we punt on the climate problem? I don't think so. Not possible. We only have one planet. So punting would mean giving up on Earth and going somewhere else. There's no punting in climate change. You are stuck. You've got to go five downs, six downs. You're pushed back. Even if people say, OK, we haven't started yet, you've got to start at some point to deal with it, because you just get pushed further and further back. There's no punting. OK, so that's, that's all. Thank you. Mr. Keeling, how long will it take for the carbon intake to um, kill the phytoplankton that uh, produce 50% of oceans, like the, the oxygen in um, the Earth? Like, how long will the warming of it, like, kill them off and, like, leave us, like, stranded? Right. So, um, so the question was, how long will it take before we kill off the organisms that make oxygen from the ocean that help us? And <clears throat> uh, in a way, I think that question is perceptive, but it also probably misses the main problem. If you go back 
in Earth history when carbon dioxide at times was higher than even we are going to send it. You find a planet that was jungly. Those, that coal seam I showed you was formed at a time when atmospheric carbon dioxide levels were higher than today. It was formed by, by a swampy environment. And oxygen was probably building up in the atmosphere then. So ironically, the world we're going into is not going to be a world that's hard for life as a whole. We're not threatening life on the planet. Trees like higher CO2. So it, we might, it may actually be a more vigorous, a more jungly planet. We don't know for sure. Of course, humans are out there scraping the land and taking everything from it. So the direct hand of humanity is serious there. Um, but we are not risking life and photosynthesis. Photosynthesis will go on by whatever organisms are able to take advantage of it. There'll be winners and losers, and it will be catastrophic for lots of things. Lots of organisms in the ocean, societies on the planet that depend on growing things where they now, where they won't be able to grow them in the future. So there's a whole range of issues that are serious. But running out of oxygen isn't really one of them. And running out of photosynthesis and, and killing off life in the ocean it really isn't in the cards. Things will die in the ocean. But other things will survive and flourish. We're just changing the landscape. Thank you very much. OK, my name is Steve Mayfield. And uh, I'm a molecular biologist. I work on what we call the upper campus here in the Department of Biology. And I work on the opposite end of the problem than Ralph does. So Ralph works on what's the consequences of burning fossil fuel and the release of CO2 into the atmosphere. And what I work on is fossil fuel is a limiting resource. Energy runs the planet. How are we going to continue to have energy in the future if we can't burn any more fossil fuel. So I work on that by working on a little tiny organism called microalgae. So who knows what algae are? Come on, you, everybody sees it. It's that green slimy stuff. Some people call me Dr. Pond Scum. <laughs> algae, by the way, is not pond scum. Okay? Algae is photosynthetic organisms that live in water. So they're just like plants, except they live in water. Okay. So why are they so important, and why do I think that these are the future of energy? Who knows where petroleum came from? Where did it come from? I heard somebody say it. Algae. Algae. That's a good guess. <laughs> Funny that I would ask that, huh? They did not come from dinosaurs. When I was a kid and Ralph was a kid, an oil company here in California called Chevron used to run commercials, and they showed dinosaurs that melted and flowed underground. And they became reservoirs of petroleum that the petroleum engineers went and found. But that's actually not true. Okay? Petroleum is quite well known. It comes from ancient algae. And it is at least 100 million to 300 million years old. So a few hundred million years ago, there were oceans like there are today. The CO2 concentration was higher in the atmosphere. And algae bloomed. Okay? We got lots and lots of algae growing in the ocean. That settled to the bottom of the oceans. That got covered with sand and silt. And over the next 100 million years, that turned into petroleum. Right? And we drill that and we pull it out of the ground. So as long as that is underground, that is called sequestered CO2. And when we pull it out and burn it, that releases CO2 into the atmosphere. But where did that CO2 come from? It came from the atmosphere and was captured by those photosynthetic organisms. So photosynthesis does the opposite of combustion. What algae does is it takes CO2 and sunlight converts those into products and releases oxygen. And then oxygen and, and fossil fuel burned releases CO2. So that's a cycle that goes on and on, right? But the problem is that we keep pulling the sequestered CO2 out of the ground and burning it. So my job is to think about how can I come up with a fuel? How can I come up with an energy source so that I can replace fossil fuel one day for the day we run out of it? So I started to work on this in earnest about 10 years ago. But when I started to work on that, the first thing that I did was I looked around and I realized how big the problem is. So now I have a couple of questions for you guys to see if you understand how big the problem is. Okay? Question number one, how much petroleum, how much oil do we burn every year in this, on this planet? Somebody give me a guess. Is it a billion gallons? Is it 100 billion gallons? Is it a trillion gallons? 
1.4 trillion gallons every year of fossil fuel gets burned worldwide. That's a really big number. But here's the alarming number for you guys. That's how much petroleum we burn, and that's only about a third of the energy we produce on this planet, because we also make electricity by burning coal, we burn methane, we, we burn lots of fossil fuels. So if you add all that up, that's actually three times that amount. So if we converted that entire number into petroleum, how much oil would each one of us in this room burn every week? How much do you, how much energy do each one of you sitting in here burn through every week? A gallon? Think about that. That's a gallon, it's about that big. Is that how much you burn through every week? Is it two gallons? Is it 10 gallons? 30 gallons? Stop me when I get close, 40 gallons. 42 gallons of energy is consumed by every person in this room every five days. Every five days, that's how much energy you're going through. How do we go, how can, how can we possibly go through that much energy? Who's got an iPhone or a Samsung phone? How much energy does that consume? Does that phone consume more energy or less energy than the refrigerator in your house? More, more. That little iPhone that you have sucks up more energy than your refrigerator. And it's not from charging the iPhone just to look at it. Why is that? Because every time you click on that and send that really important text message or picture to your friend, that goes through an enormous computer farm. If you're Apple, it's out in Utah. If you're, if you're on the Amazon one, it's out in Arizona. But those enormous computer farms suck up huge amounts of energy. The number one electricity consumer on the planet today is the Google computer farm. Number one. Okay, so I also think about, so okay, so those numbers are enormous, and that makes it very challenging. But here's kind of an interesting one, which has really impacted biofuels lately. Who knows what the price of oil is? What's a guess? Shout one out. Is it $10 a barrel? 37, somebody said 37 is pretty good. That's about what it was today. I think it was 39 today. Okay, it's about $39 a barrel today. But, but two years ago, it was $100 a barrel, right? And at $100 a barrel, that makes gasoline about $4 a gallon. And gasoline at $4 a gallon, you guys probably complain about that or your parents complain about it a little bit. But at $4 a gallon, what really happens? We get cars that are more fuel efficient. But it turns out that there's a direct correlation between the cost of energy and the cost of food. And at $100 a barrel, 2 billion people on this planet, one, just about one third of the planet, cannot afford to feed their families, right? So one of the really good things about oil at $39 a barrel is a lot more people can afford to feed their families. But it's kind of an artificial price. It's gonna go back to $100 a barrel pretty quick because we are running out of it. But what happens is when we have cost of food that is too high for people to afford, what do they do? You don't starve to death. You don't sit there and not eat. What do you do? You, you, you go take food from somebody who has it right? Or you borrow a gun, or if somebody tells you, hey, come and join ISIS, right? Or come be a Somali pirate. We'll tell you how to get food. That's what you do. So the reason we have problems in the world today is actually related to energy, right? It's related to expensive energy causing the price of food to be very high. Okay, so how does that come back to algae, and how am I going to impact that, right? Well, what does petroleum come from? It comes from algae. So if petroleum comes from algae, then I should be able to get oil from algae, and I should be able to turn that into energy. And the really nice thing about that is the energy that we burn is called what? Who knows what the general term for that is? Is it called a protein? Is it called a carbohydrate? Is it called a hydrocarbon? Yes, it's called a hydrocarbon. Okay. What does that mean? That means it only has hydrogen and carbon in it. That's what we burn. 
What is algae loaded with? About 30% of it is hydrocarbon, and the other two-thirds of it are protein and carbohydrates. Who knows what proteins and carbohydrates are? Rubio's fish taco. That's a good one. It's Rubio's fish tacos. That's food. So the other two-thirds of algae is food. That means when I grow up algae, I can take one-third of it, and I can turn that into energy or anything that's made from petroleum, and I can take the other two-thirds of that and turn it into food. Well, this now gives me a way out. Now, even though there's 7 billion people, 7.4 billion people on the planet, and they're all hungry, and many of them want to run power their iPhones, I now tell them, well, maybe I can do that for you if I can just figure out how to grow algae at a large enough scale. But I got to get it a large scale, and I got to get it cheap. And those two things are actually the big challenge that we have today. We can grow algae. We grow algae in my lab all the time, and we extract oil from it, and we turn it into biodiesel, and a couple of knucklehead students drove a motorcycle on it last year and crashed it. They didn't hurt themselves, but they broke their motorcycle. So this year we decided, well, we're not going to take that fuel and turn it, we're not going to take that oil from algae and turn it into fuel. And because algae is petroleum, what is the most important product in San Diego made from petroleum? Come on. But in San Diego, what's the most important thing that we make that isn't gasoline? Polyurethane. 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 What do you make into, what do you make, what do you use polyurethane for? Surfboards. You don't use polyurethane in electronics. You, use, you probably do use some of it. You make surfboards. So this year we made a surfboard out of algae. In fact, we made seven of them. And we gave one of them to the mayor of San Diego, Kevin Faulkner. And Kevin loved our little algae surfboard, so he took it all around the world, and then irresponsibly, he gave it to the president of Japan Airlines. He gave it to the president of Japan Airlines because they had opened a route between Tokyo and San Diego because they wanted to promote biotechnology exchange. And the mayor decided that a surfboard made from algae was the coolest biotechnology thing he had ever seen. So he gave it to them, and then the minute he got back to San Diego, he called me up and said, Steve, would you make me another one? So I did. So Kevin has one. I have one. I can't believe I didn't bring it today. It's sitting in my office. So in the future, what are we going to do? We're going to do a couple of things. One is we're going to produce energy from different ways than we do it today. We are not going to produce this from fossil fuel. We are going to do this from photovoltaics. We are going to do this from wind. And I think we're going to do this from algae. We are also going to find ways to produce food cheaper than we do now and more efficiently than we do now because the price of energy is going to go back up. The price of petroleum is going to go back to $100 a barrel. And when it's $100 a barrel, we can't tell the bottom 2 billion people on the planet tough luck, right? What we have to tell them instead is, Let's work together to figure out how you can afford to feed your family, right? And I think we're going to do that from algae, and I think we're going to do that from a lot of other things, but all of these things require a really good understanding of science and technology. So the future jobs in this country are not going to be in petroleum engineering. They're going to be in algae engineering. So I'm going to end it there, and then I think maybe we're going to take some questions. So thank you all for your attention. How much is like one surfboard and how long does it make like how long does it take to make one? So a surfboard today, if you go and buy a, a surfboard, the retail cost is about seven hundred dollars. But but the wholesale cost for that surfboard is about three hundred and fifty dollars. And the part that we made out of algae is the core of it, which is called the blank. And that blank cost about 60 bucks to buy one. So you buy a blank for $60, and then you have to shape it, and then you have to paint it, and then you have to put a layer of fiberglass around it. So the actual petroleum part of a surfboard is only about two kilograms, okay? So it, it's actually pretty light. So if you get a petroleum blank, it costs you about $60, and if you get one made from algae, it costs about $64. So that's only about $4 more, but for the price of a surfboard, by the time you see it in the, in the retail market, that would only be about $704 instead of $700. So we think we can be cost competitive, and we think that good kids like you who care about the environment 
we'll spend four dollars more for a renewable surfboard made from algae the other nice thing about our surfboard is because it's made from algae not petroleum it's also biodegradable which means if you peel the fiberglass layer off the surface of it and and bury it in your compost pile it'll be eaten by fungus and bacteria good question my question is that seeing how there's so much research research being done in the field of um, renewable energy sources such as your algae research or research on uh, thermal energy, is do you think that there's going to be any um, push with, um, within that um, research field to make renewable energy sources more readily available available to um, any any common person, so to say? Yeah. So so that. Let, let, let me put let me let me rephrase that question, which is what good does it do us if we make renewable energy and it's not affordable for everyone? So right now I, I have photovoltaics on top of my house and I bought an electric car. I bought a little Ford. It's a cute little car. Um, and so I, so I drive around on an electric car, but that's very expensive. That car costs thirty thousand dollars and it costs twenty thousand dollars to put the photovoltaics on top of my house. So clearly everybody can't afford that. All right. So what we have to think about in the future is how do we make renewable energy and then how do we make sure that's affordable for everyone? Part of the way we can do that is by being much more efficient at the way we burn energy, right? Every time you see a light, if it's not an LED today, if it's an incandescent light bulb, you should just immediately unscrew that and put in an, an LED light bulb. Because the more efficient we are, that lowers the demand on electricity. And I'm sure all of you had economics and understand supply and demand. So if we can keep the supply high and we decrease the demand, that will force the price of it down. But then the other thing we can do is that we can think about new technologies. And, and then from the very beginning, we think about, is this affordable? I think in the past, many scientists wanted to do the kind of coolest thing. Like we all, we all want to make the greatest little invention, right? And sometimes we didn't think about price at all. And so we made inventions that worked and kind of worked really well, but they were too expensive for anyone to afford. But now all of the research that we do in my lab and all of the groups that I know that work on renewable energy, their next question is, OK, this will work, but will it work at a cost that people can use it? So we think about that all the time. And there is no one answer to that. There are many, many different ways we can keep that cost down. But that's a great question. Uh, hello. My yep. question to you is, so what other products can you make out of algae? Pretty much anything that you can make out of petroleum, you can make out of algae. So uh, last December, after our algae surfboard had gone around the world and people had seen it, we got a call from a company called Adidas. And the Adidas engineer said, hey, if you can make a surfboard from polyurethane, then you can make shoe soles from polyurethane. So the next product that we're working on, and we've already started on it right now, are flip-flops made from polyurethane from algae oil. And in this case, we're not just going to make them renewable and biodegradable. We're going to make them compostable. So the entire shoe will be biodegradable, so the strap and every part of it, so that when you're done with that shoe, like if you're at my house and your big dog chews the toe off it, Rather than throw that in the garbage pile, you throw that in the compost pile and then go get a new one. So shoes are going to be number two, and then we're going to work from there to all the other things that you can make out of plastic. Thank you. So my question was, if climate change is sort of increased by a rise in carbon, and that is one thing that makes algae grow, could it be said that climate change could also cause famines because of the change in um, kind of the weather and how much uh, plants are able to grow? Yeah, so I think that's already doing that. So, so some of you may know that one of the serious problems in Syria was that they, like we here in California, had a very severe drought for the last five years. In fact, it shut down much of their agriculture. And when you shut down agriculture, people who live in agricultural communities leave those communities because there's no opportunity, no food, and they move to the cities. So one of the ideas in Syria is that so many people moved to the cities two and three years ago, and they had no jobs or no opportunity there, that this was part of the significant sort of fuel that added to the fire of their, of their civil war. So absolutely, climate change can have dramatic impacts on crop and crop productivity. Just in my lifetime, in my and Ralph's lifetime, it used to be that you grew corn commercially in Texas. 
And when I was a kid, the Corn Belt started about halfway up Texas and went to just south of the Canadian border. Today, there's no more corn production in Texas. It's got too hot and too dry. And now you can actually grow corn in Canada. So just over the last 50 years, we've actually seen agriculture, a, a really big, important crop for us, corn, migrate farther and farther north. So this has a dramatic impact. And it's not a dramatic impact in the future. It's a dramatic impact today. It's already impacting us. OK, one more question. Last question. There's one student left. Um, my name is Chris, and I want to know if what is magnetic reversal, and does climate change have anything to do with it? Sorry, what was the mechanism of? M magnetic reversal. And does oh, man, I'm leaving that one to Ralph. Does climate change have anything to do with magnetic reversal of the poles? Not by algae. It's a, it's a, okay, magnetic reversal has to do with the, the Earth's magnetic field flipping between having north pointing, that, the compass pointing that way towards the north or pointing towards the south. And that's happened, I don't know, the last time that happened in a big way was 35,000 years ago or something, um, and 50,000 years ago. And there's some discussion of maybe us approaching another reversal. But these, these kind of things happen naturally. They happen on a, on a, on a time frame of, of, of tens of thousands of years or longer. And I don't think there's strong indications of it causing changes in climate, although there are probably some. And the reason is that it changes the influx of cosmic. So the Earth's magnetic field shields the Earth from cosmic rays that come in. And the cosmic rays can change the ions in the atmosphere, which can change the weather. So it's, it is possible that the reversals do affect climate. And they, it's possible they did it in the past. They do not stand out in the past as a big influence. And in any case, they're nothing they got nothing really to do with what's happening now with climate change because it would be going on in a much too slow a time frame. We're seeing changes on decade to decade. That would be a change over tens of thousands of years. Okay. Let's, let's give a hand for our two uh, keynoters there, Ralph and Stephen. You don't hear, this is from the horse's mouth, the people that are several waves beyond anything what you'll read or see on TV, but you will see it there later. They know what they're doing. I'm Jessica Blanton. I'm a grad student here. Eventually, I hope to be like Noel, Dr. Jessica Blanton, maybe in a few years. Um, and what I work on here is mostly uh, the microbial uh, organisms that live in association with other animals. So basically, microbial symbioses. And most of my work involves a little bit of what we'd consider classic microbiology, but, but the, the rest of it involves working with sequence data and things like this. So I'd be happy to talk with you guys a little bit more about what I do, but also the methods I use and how people get into this type of profession and why. My name is Chef Robert Ruiz. I was you about 25 years ago. I came through here doing the Science Olympiad and learned about scripts and I learned about NOAA and I learned about this whole campus and uh, I've worked my way up now to, I own a restaurant up in Carlsbad up in North County, but um, I started off cleaning fryers and worked my way up and I learned how to be a chef out in Hawaii 10 years out there. And what I learned out there is how to cook and how to source things for my restaurant sustainably. So at the restaurant I have now, we compost all of our organic matter, we reclaim all of our water, we only serve sustainably sourced species, we break all these things down ourselves, we have our own farm for the restaurant. We're like a global example of the best practices by which to create a, a restaurant that supplies you know wholesome food to a community without uh, any real negative or uh, you know, the best possible uh, solutions that are available now, we're still working on it. Um, but what I did is I traveled the world as a chef. I've been through, you know, I was in Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, Nagoya, all the Hawaiian islands, New York, you know, France. I just got back from London uh, where I actually won an award as a chef restaurateur of the world for helping these scientists communicate the message of one of the most critically endangered marine mammals in the world, the vaquita porpoise, which is just down here in the Gulf of Baja. But um, I guess what I could say is that if you guys have questions about your, how you're going to matriculate through, how you're going to come from where you're sitting now to learn how, uh, how to be involved here at any of these campuses and how it really applies in real life, 
that's what I was able to do. And these guys uh, welcomed me with open arms. And I've literally got to go lab to lab and tour the facility and been welcomed by everybody that I had questions for about what I could do and what uh, I was passionate about. So I'm very blessed to be here today. And uh, man, you guys, I hope you guys realize how lucky you are. And uh, the last little side note I have to say is that when I was in your shoes, in my mind, I always thought that there was some lab somewhere with a thousand scientists monitoring each one of the world's little problems that we're suffering through. But the reality is that there is not. It's a, it's a group, it's a team effort that comes from one little group of people, one small classroom of people that, you know, chain reacts into a global effort. So I hope you guys use your time wisely and realize that here in San Diego, this is the Super Bowl of sustainability to continue the football pun here. Everything you wanna know about sustainability, the world's leaders are all right here. Um, hi everyone, I'm Noelle. I'd like to share with you a couple of things how I got here. Uh, similar to you, uh, I was in high school and I was like, wow, I love biology, this is great. I'm gonna to go to college, first in my family. My family's from Jamaica. My parents came here to raise my brother and me to give us better opportunities. Um, so glad that they did. The things that, it's funny, I didn't realize until I finished my PhD thinking about what did I learn from my family? Because a lot of what we learn and what we know, we get from our families. And, and let's all be proud of those things because what my family taught me, no one in my family is a scientist. Um, they taught me hard work and a, and a really strong work ethic and self-respect. And um, that's really important because any of you could be up here in just a matter of years. Any of you could be giving the keynote talks here in just a matter of years. It just depends on what you want to do you, and how you want to get there. Because just like you, there were people up here when I was your age, and all I did was ask questions. Ask your questions. Whatever you're excited about, whatever interests you, that's what I ended up doing. And I got to college. I went to here to UC San Diego as an undergrad. And I, we didn't have much. And so I got student loans and scholarships. And I, I paid my own way. And, and in doing so, I found people professors like Lahini that would give me a chance um, and answer my questions and let me come to class and come after class. And that's how I did it. And then right before I graduated from UCSD with an, well, an undergrad degree in biology and anthropology, I happened upon somebody that worked for NOAA. And I told you, you should know what NOAA is. I didn't know what NOAA was. I didn't know. And I was a senior in college. And they said, oh, well, there's a job opening down the hill at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. It's by the ocean. And I said, well, I've been to the library. So I went and I said, I heard there's a job. I'm graduating college in three weeks. What's this job? They said, oh, well, we need somebody to sort ichthyoplankton samples. And I thought, ichthyoplankton. I know it, that the root word ich means fish, and I know what plankton are. So I was like, I can sort ichthyoplankton. If that's what you need, I will do it. And so, because I was getting out of college, I had to repay my loans. And they said, oh, great, great, sort samples. And then, guys, they sent me on a boat. I got paid to go on a boat and collect fishes. Fishes, multiple species, by the way, fish, one species. And so I did that. And then I, I kept going, and I kept, got to help on research projects. And I said, can I come up with my own research project? They said, well, you need a bit more training. You might need to get a PhD. Well, can I do that? And that's what I did. And so just don't be afraid to ask. It's OK if you don't know. And it's good that you don't know, because there are other people that know that will help you. And in doing so, in, in other people teaching you what, what they know, you end up learning things that they don't. And then all of what we all do here, we do together. We have to collaborate. No one person can know everything. That just doesn't exist. And so um, thanks for being here. Thanks for wanting to hear from us. And I'll pass it over so that we can get to your questions. Well, prepare your questions now for the panel. And I had one, though, for, for Rob. You know, um, are you a typical executive chef? I mean, how did you get to be who you are? Did you, I mean, that's kind of strange. A lot of people are going to be great cooks or chefs, but not everybody is as accomplished. And uh, were you kind of a knockabout surfer dude, or what was going on there? Yeah, no, I mean, you guys, you know, you're going to make me blush with talking to me about it like that. But uh, I, um, no, I, I honestly, I was born and raised in Oceanside. I'm very proud of my neighborhood, you know. I grew up in Oceanside in North County and uh, started surfing up there. And uh, I, was, I was all about it. And I ended up surfing and going to Hawaii for a pro contest. 
and I was 14. And uh, then I was, you know, I had a family that had some trouble and I didn't want to be around it. And I had friends that surfed out there. So I was able to buy a plane ticket and get out to the big island. And uh, I literally, you know, I, I was broken homeless, man. I had $5 and quarters to my name. I bought a sack of rice and I would go through people's yards and steal little guavas and pineapples and stuff to try to make it. And then uh, a friend of mine gave me a job cooking and, uh, you know, I just stuck with it. And then I just like Noel was saying, I just kept asking questions. You know, I got very serious about it. And then living in Hawaii for 10 years, you know, it's one of the most isolated island chains in the world. It's 2000 miles to Cali and basically 2000 to Japan. And uh, we had to learn how to be resourceful. And I learned going to school there, the ancient Hawaiians were some of the most resourceful people on the planet. They fashioned everything they needed for their lives out of plants. And they actually had their own aquaculture system and the uh, Hualalai Resort was a hotel I earned a job at and we reclaimed those same Hawaiian fish ponds and harvested fish out of them. So I got trained on an island where I had, uh, I raised fish in aquaculture, we raised shrimp in aquaculture, we had our own farm, our own garden, and we took everything from the island in a way that wouldn't hurt it. And that's where I learned how to cook. So then when I came back home to California, I walked into these restaurants and saw what they were serving and it just made me sick to my stomach. It hurt my feelings as a person that this is what was being served to the community. So I just kept asking questions and I got upset about it and now I have like a vendetta. And I worked as a cook and as a dishwasher and the lowest guy on the totem pole. Uh, out of the four seasons I worked out, there was 60 chefs in the culinary department and I was number 58. So any job that I had to do, 58 other chefs said, no way, I'm not gonna do that. So I had to pick up the slack. And uh, that's basically what happened. And um, I worked my way up all the way till I was running three restaurants for a restaurant group. And I was like, I'm tired of making money for other people that are doing things the wrong way. It was the same thing, like, oh, just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean it's right. Well, what I've learned is that these people who don't have a sincere care for you and your well-being. They just want to make money. And that really upset me, <laughs> you know? So I started going through and species by species. I, you know, I called to Noah about eight years ago now. I called for my restaurant and I called to Noah and they sent me to the people who run fishwatch.gov, which is their just US fisheries website. And I, they, I actually got an answer and I said, hey, I'm, I'm in my hometown serving food to my family and friends. What's the best fish I can serve? And they said, wow, we're so happy you called. You're the first chef out of 400 million Americans to ever call us and ask what to serve. You know, so I mean, from there, I just kept at it. And, um, you know, now I went from trying to understand here with the hard work that's done here and going to NOAA to the Southwestern Fisheries Science Center to the HMS lab there and you know speaking with like Bob Olson and these guys these people who study all the tuna all the dolphins all the marine mammals all the people that study all those creatures in the world are headquartered here in San Diego so you know I just have um, I don't know I guess uh, it started off being just wanting to serve the right thing and now I, I've, I've realized that um, I actually have been given a voice by this community to speak in, into and about these problems globally and uh, so I don't take it lightheartedly and I, I want to do everything I can so that my goal has always been to imagine a restaurant that um, is in, you know, 2050 that's clean and pure and serving the right things. And, you know, everybody is, can eat whatever they want without hesitation as opposed to now. You know, there's a lot of other parts of the world that are doing a lot better job in the States. So I figure it's time for us to pick up the slack. Well, thank you. Doing well by doing right. Yeah. We, we should have some questions prepared in the back, but Jessica, do you have a story that uh, might be of interest to? Oh, you know, um, I didn't really explain a little bit about what my work has to do with why you guys are sitting here. And to be honest, what I have to say at the end of the day is I know something, I know some place that you can go and get a job. Um, right now, uh, when we think about sustainable seafood, et cetera, we think about what are the fishes we can take out of the water and what are the stocks? We do a lot of studying about what's threatened, what's endangered, but one area that's really expanding in San Diego, especially, or I'd say in the US right now, is this idea that, well, maybe we can use all that vast ocean to actually farm fish. 
So where that comes in with what I do is so microbial uh, symbiosis I talk about is if you think about all of the microbiology that goes into agriculture in general, growing plants, um, dealing with cattle, all of that becomes really important when it comes to aquaculture. And Noel, you might be able to tell me if this is right. We are now permitting for offshore uh, sea pens. Has anybody been down to Ensenadas and seen the sea pens down there? Yeah, a few people. We're going to have those on our coastline now. So you can imagine this giant pen of fish. They have to eat something, and they have to also produce a lot of waste, and they're putting a lot of things into the water. They're taking a lot of things out of the water. So I have to say, as a microbiologist, it's kind of this sweet spot where you're like, man, there's going to be a lot of new jobs opening up. <laughs> so that's kind of where I'm going with that, because when you think about the sustainable food you eat, it's not just the species, it's where it came from, who farmed it, how it was farmed. Um, and part of that is understanding how uh, the fish is healthy. And a big piece of that is understanding how these tiny organisms that are everywhere are part of how that fish experiences the world, how it gets nutrition, and how waste is remediated. We can get into that another time. What we are talking about up here, um, Don Kent yes. from the Rose Canyon Fisheries Project, uh, the fish that they're talking about, I actually have um, the, the guy who's, I don't know what his title is, he's like the director of the Hub SeaWorld Hatchery. So he has come to me and on this Wednesday, the 23rd, right, the tomorrow, um, I have a dinner for about 100 people at my restaurant, so I better remember. Um, but I'm going to, for the first time, be serving the striped bass that is coming um, from this project. So this project that's in the works right now, I'm, uh, Don came to me and said he yeah, has some striped bass that he's gonna let me serve at the restaurant, which I'm proud to do because it gives me a opportunity to have a, you know, it's a world's first. It's the first time it's gonna be a brand new thing for San Diego and I'm a huge advocate for it as long as we have people like this doing the research, making sure it's gonna be safe, you know? But um, man, it's gonna be a bunch of money and thousands and thousands of jobs. So amen for that. So this question is for Chef Ruiz. Is it more expensive to serve healthy, sustainable food? No, it's not. It's quite a myth that I'm working my, dedicating my life to. Uh, people, you can imagine, you know, the amount of energy, right? Time, labor that it takes to get a vessel of these, you know, these massive floating factories out into the ocean and have them being, you know, persaining and trawling and, you know, vacuuming our oceans out of, the, out of fish. Um, and then to have that processed and broken down and shipped and then flown halfway around the world so you can get some frozen piece of fish about six ounces that costs you know thirty dollars a pound where for me i can go down to thankfully to the tuna harbor dockside market on saturday and get fish straight off the dock from local fishermen that are coming from our waters that are now being fished in a very diverse way instead of just vacuuming specific species out of the water and i can buy a whole so I can get a whole albacore for $4 a pound as opposed to buying a frozen one from halfway around the ocean for you know, $15 or $20 a pound. The other thing that is uh, vital about that is that we're utilizing the entire creature. So I get to, you know, I take the fillets off, I'll take the cheeks out of the fish, I'll take the commas, which we call just behind the gill plate and the pectoral fin, there's this little triangulated piece of flesh that happens to be the most delicious part of the fish that most fishmongers throw away. We save it and we'll grill it and serve it to our most respected customers, you know? We really emphasize just like pig to snout when you're a butcher with, you know, any terrestrial proteins. It's the same thing with fish. We really are trying to say local, sustainable, use the whole creature, you know, it's better for everybody. And yeah, it's way more effective. It's, uh, uh, you know, I have better margins of profit on what I sell because I get it for a better price because I'm willing to learn or educated myself on how to butcher these creatures. But it's also better for the community because now I'm supporting a local fisherman who's putting his kids through schools here in San Diego that are buying, you know, putting their own money back to the community. So it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, are there any more questions for anybody on the panel? No, all right. Okay, let's have a big hand for everybody there.